I'm a hustler, baby. It's time for Hustle Her Podcast. I'm your host, Deshae Keynes. Hustle Her is all about inspiring women through real life experiences that have helped to mold and develop not only me, but my guest into the entrepreneurs and leaders we are today. If you're an enterprising woman determined to succeed and looking for a bit of motivation, a bit of tough love, and some actionable takeaways to be the best you, girl, you are in the right place. Hey guys, and welcome back to Hustle Her Podcast. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I genuinely appreciate it. As always, big shout out to our season sponsors, Brown and Company and 59 Front. So today I am super excited. One, fanning, but also super excited for my next guest. Not only is she a Forbes under 30, 30 under 30 for 2023, she also has the fastest growing brand in Sephora for 2023. She's also the youngest woman to raise 2 million in investor funding, as well as 10 plus million in VC funding. She also is a philanthropist who has literally given over $100,000 to around the world. And then also she's donated here in Bermuda as well. Well, my next guest is Alamade, the founder and CEO of Topical. Hi, hey. so excited to be here. Girl, so <laughs> am I. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I slept well last night. That's I slept good. Well. Um, how are you? I'm good. That's a, thank you for asking that. That doesn't always happen, you know. It doesn't <laughs> go both ways. So I'm actually good with that. But yeah, I'm doing well in the gym. I so love that. day two. <laughs> <laughs> I am not doing as well. I've been traveling so much mm-hmm. this last six months that mm-hmm. I have, I'm completely off my Pilates game. But mm-hmm. as soon as I touch down, mm-hmm. I have like an intense boot camp for like a week <laughs> where I have to go on another trip. But yeah. I'm going to do like maybe even twice a day okay. to try and just... Catch back up. Catch back up. Yeah, I feel it. We're definitely. Be, uh, Debt to mm-hmm. December is coming up, and I definitely <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. have to look good. So There you go. So we're all for that. All right. So hopefully mine lasts a little bit longer than the two days, but I'm committed <laughs> as of right now, so we're good to go. All right. So we start with a few rapid-fire questions, and then we're going to jump right in. Cool? Okay, cool. All right. So um, I'm happiest when? Ooh, I'm happiest when I am creating, when mm. I'm... Uh, I have this new thing that I say. Um, I call people who are similar to me left brain creatives. Mm. So a left brain creative is someone who creates new ways of doing business or new ways of um, talking to customers and just creating magic in the business world. And the reason why I have like coined this term left brain creative is the right side of your brain is actually the creative side. That's mm-hmm. like the side that can sing and draw. The left side of your brain is more analytical. It's mm-hmm. the one that does numbers and um I never felt like I was either one or the other, right? Mm. Like I'm not the best person at finance. Um, while I can read a, an Excel sheet, mm-hmm. I'm not the person who's building the p and right? Got you. Um, but on the other side, I can't draw. Mm. Um, I can sing a little bit. I can hold a tune. I, a hold a tune. I'm a, I call myself a praise team singer. Praise team, exactly. <laughs> I can do that, but I'm not necessarily the person who like, I know how to like match colors together mm-hmm. or um, I was talking about earlier about my content creator mm-hmm. friends. I'm, I struggle with content. Mm-hmm. Um, and so- this idea of a left brain creative is is matched ma- meshing them two together, right? Got so it. left brain being analytical mm-hmm. and smart, but then creative. How do you take that analytical skill and apply it to something that feels creative? Mm. So I, I like that. definitely feel happiest when I am really in my left brain creative mode. I'm gonna steal that. You can you coined it, girl. But I'm gonna I'm <laughs> give you your credit. But I'm gonna steal that one because I like that too. Because I cannot draw to save my life. Yeah. But you know you get you get sparked and you know inspired yeah. and so yeah left. But brain But I think creative. the issue is that we shouldn't just look at creatives mm-hmm. as just like one thing mm. like creative is not just a person who can sing or draw or, or like design clothes mm-hmm. like you can be creative in kind of any sphere yeah, that you're in absolutely okay um so tell me your nighttime skincare routine so as you know a founder of a skincare brand like what do you do I am such a function girl it's mm-hmm. so funny the reason why topicals is the way it is which is that we only create like the best product for each skin condition like mm. we don't create an entire line of products we literally target that one mm. problem you're having so um if you have dark spots you know faded serum for your face faded yeah. mist for your body for your under eye eye area faded eye mask like mm-hmm. we do not create like a full line mm. um it's because i'm the same way like i have a very simple routine i use the use of the people cleanser mm-hmm. i use the good molecules um 
um, it's a toner. Mm-hmm. I, I used to never be a toner girl, mm-hmm. but like I've been a toner girl recently. Let me tell you, yeah. because I have such oily skin, mm-hmm. the toner is really great because it really does help shrink the size of my pores, yeah. and I notice that I'm not as oily. Yeah. Um, and then I use faded because mm-hmm. I literally still have dark spots. Like, yes. You know, acne just pops up yep. all the time. It's like you get rid of the dark mm-hmm. spot and it comes back. And then back. it comes back. Yeah. So I use faded. And then I use like butter as my moisturizer. Okay. If not like butter, the other moisturizer I've really been loving is the Charlotte Tilbury mm. um, um, moisturizer. I can't remember what it is, but it's it's really good base for your makeup. Yeah. So I use the Charlotte Tilbury one yeah, for my makeup as well. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. It's like not heavy, not mm-hmm. oily. And again, I have super oily skin. Um, and then I use sealed, which mm-hmm. is our new yeah. like acne scarring primer. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily have acne scars, but again, I have really large pores. Mm-hmm. So it really just creates that film nice. on my makeup. And yeah, that's before I get into my makeup. So, okay. All right, cool. All right. Who would you say is your closest friend or friends? Ooh, that's really interesting. So I'm really close with my family, my okay. sister and my brother are really close to me we all are very similar obviously we were raised by the same parents but we're also very different yeah and I love that about us so I would say my siblings are definitely who I'm really close to Mm -hmm. and then um my best friend Donye um I always say she's like the other side of my brain so while I'm left brain she's Mm -hmm. very much right brain Mm -hmm. but I think I'm teaching her how to be more left brain she's Mm -hmm. teaching me how to be more right brain um so I'd say I'm really close to her and then my college friends um that I ran track with Mm -hmm. I still keep in touch with them um yeah I would say those are the people that I'm super close with I think what's really fun about my life right now is like I'm exiting a lot of um like old self in a Mm. sense and I'm like entering into like a new self yeah and in entering into this new self it's taken me to so many different cities and I think I um yeah I'm just like learning so much about different cultures and different people yeah so I take my best friends with me I take the people that I live with me obviously we talk on the phone we FaceTime but it's been really fun to make new friends yeah I think it evolves as well as you get older like you have your childhood friends people that have been ride or die for forever but like in different phases of your life as you get older you have different like segments of friends yeah. too and I love when they all come together as well that's yeah. my, one of my favorite parts because it's like oh you know this and then you like oh now I see why you get on why exactly exactly it's super yeah. cool all right cool um so huge brand all these things what was like the first thing you kind of spent your first big paycheck on Ooh, first big payday that's a great question. It's so funny. Mm-hmm. I am obsessed with shoes mm, and handbags. Same girl. So obsessed. Mm-hmm. So I think the first big girl purchase I made was a purse. Mm-hmm. And it was a purse that I needed because I was traveling a ton. So I needed to put my laptop in there yeah. and all those things. It was a Goyard tote. Mm. And that, to me, was such a big deal. Big deal. I was so excited about it. Mm-hmm. I thought Goyard was such a cool brand. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that was my first big girl purchase. Okay. All right. Um. What does love feel like? Ooh. Love feels like a safe space to explore yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... Love in the past to me, I maybe have thought that it was an, um, a feeling, right? But I think love actually is a practice. Mm. Um, I've heard that a lot. People say that love is a practice. And um, yeah, I think that it's a, it's a place that feels safe enough for you to be yourself, get it wrong, and for you not to be judged. I think it's difficult, though, because mm-hmm. as humans... Like, you want to see the best parts of someone. You don't yeah. always want to see the full 360. Mm-hmm. But I think in those moments, being able to see people at their lowest or when they're struggling and still choosing to love them, mm-hmm. that's why love is a practice. Because you have to choose yeah. to still love that Every person day. or to love yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's another thing. We talk a lot about, like, external love, loving someone else. And I think the last two years have really been a journey of, like, love for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, it's, like, accepting that I'm not always going to be the happiest I'm not always going to be the most smiley. Yeah. And that's okay. I was very much a people pleaser. Mm. And I still kind of am. But yeah, I feel like, like girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think like loving myself has very much been like, it's okay to set a boundary and mm. say, I actually can't do that. Mm. Um, still working on it, but yeah, I know we not perfect, but you know, <laughs> we will all get there one day. Yeah. All right. So what are you listening to right now? What's on repeat for you? UK rap. So I moved really? to London. <laughs> I moved to London in August and I've just been around so many people who are like, really shaping the music industry a lot mm. of my like good friends that I'm with in London and so 
I've just been listening to so much music. So I was listening this morning, and I almost feel like it's a morning playlist. Mm -hmm. It's an all-the-time playlist, but it's a morning playlist for me for sure to, like, amp me up for the day. And the the playlist is literally called Sounds from Ends. Um, I made that up. Yeah. I'll take credit for that one. Um, So corny. But Sounds from Ends, and on that – Playlist, the first song on that playlist is Park Chin Hua mm-hmm. by Hetty One and K Trap. Mm-hmm. Uh, such a good song. I really love it. The next song is Trojan Horse by Dave and Central C. Mm. Um, um, so I'm not up on my UK rap. So oh, now I feel like I need to go I and will get send up you on this it. Playlist. Okay, send it to me for um, sure. Who else do I have on there? I have Unknown T, Goodums. Mm-hmm. That's a really great song. Okay. Um, Rushy, Pressure. That's a great song. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is on there? Starlight by Dave, mm. um, Clash by Stormzy and Dave. I'm really, I know I'm a really Stormzy. Big, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm a really big Dave fan. I'm, I've been waiting for a name that yeah. I knew. <laughs> I like Dave and Tia Cola Meridian. Mm. So yeah, I'm listening to a lot of UK rap. And then on the other side too, I'm listening to a lot of like young women mm-hmm. who are like rappers. So like, um, I'm listening to Brazy, who's out of Nigeria. She mm. has a song called OMG that's really good. And um, Aton. Uh, in fr- it's French for, um, what, what is it French for? At- attention? I think attention is what? Oh, I'm not sure. It's, but it's a- Aton. Um, I'm listening to uh, Deto Black. Mm-hmm. I'm listening to, who else? Chi Virgo. Okay. Um, I'm just really loving like the young African women mm-hmm. in um, rap and music. And then from South Africa, I'm definitely listening to Tyla. I'm okay, listening yeah, to yeah. Elaine. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's been like a really cool mix. I think my, what I'm really realizing though, is that in all of these different geographies, I'm actually seeing a lot of African artists yeah. in a lot of different genres mm-hmm. play in these spaces. And mm-hmm. I'm having so much fun listening to them. Yeah, definitely. I'm loving how like Afro beats is weaving into, and it's now more mainstream than yes. it ever has been before. Like I went to an Afro nation concert this year. Like yeah. I would have never like two years ago, that wouldn't have even been on my list of things. To right. Do. So I absolutely love it. So yeah. yeah. Okay. And then finally, so this has become a thing this year. Well, the last two seasons, um, who is your celebrity? Well, I guess for you, who was your celebrity crush growing up? Hmm. Because I'm not trying to put you out there, child. You kill your celebrity crush <laughs> now, and that becomes a becomes thing. A thing. <laughs> um, who was my celebrity crush growing up? You know what's so funny? And I always say this, um, that, like, I just wasn't that girl who mm. was, like, you didn't feel you know, like people have, like, a, a fairy tale, like, their wedding and all that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I was thinking about, but it wasn't that. <laughs> I Girl, think it was because I was such building a Building this brand, boy. apparently. Was, yeah. <laughs> like, from since when I was little, I've been very entrepreneurial. I was very sports-oriented. Yeah. I ran track. I played basketball. I played volleyball. Like, I was so into sports. Growing up. And, again, not that I didn't have crushes on people, mm-hmm. but I just can't for the life of me think of someone where I was like, mm, oh, my goodness, you. Yeah. you know, this person. Yeah. Yeah. The only, for some reason, the only person that is coming to mind is Troy Bolton from High School Musical. And that can't be real. Mm, man, I mean, if that's your thing, I'm not hating. That's okay. I mean, but you I'm, know. I'm like, is, is it really him or is it just him because I was obsessed with High School Musical? I mean, it's a possibility. It could yeah. just be a possibility. So High School Musical came out when I was a little bit older. So I only know about it because of my sisters mm. who want the two of them are close to your age. So mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. But I, um, I don't remember a lot of the people from High School Musical except for What's his name? Um, Zac Afron, yes. But then it was another guy. The Corbin black Blue? Guy, Corbin, Corbin Blue. Blue. Yeah. So Corbin Blue was I, cute, too. Let Corbin me tell you, I was too. thinking Corbin Blue, but I was thinking, I was like, I wanted to say the Cordon Blue. So I was like, that's <laughs> the wrong thing. <laughs> so I didn't want to say that. But right. yeah, so that's why I didn't say it, because I was like, maybe that's not his name. But yeah, yeah, I'm trying to also think, and I also think the other issue is like, there are other people that I'm thinking about that like, maybe I had a crush on, I thought they mm-hmm. were cute, but they're so problematic now that I can't yeah. even say their you name. You sure can't. There's Girl, so many like even in R&B my mind, singers that I would love to say are my, but they have done things over the years that I'm like, Girl, it's unexcusable. Unexcusable. One hundred percent. And you say one thing, and we're, we're not trying to tank yeah. nobody's brand today. So we definitely, <laughs> I would say the music stars were definitely yeah. like, you know, there's some songs that I know take you right. Back. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of one particular artist mm-hmm. who was dancing. Mm-hmm. 
and he was young and yeah, he yeah. was cute. You know who mm-hmm. I'm talking about. I got you. But it's just like, it's just so sad that like I, we can't even like people anymore because yeah. people are just doing. Just not acting right. Not acting right. Mm-hmm. And doing the right. And the crazy part about it is we're, we live in a day and age now where it doesn't matter when you did something. Yeah. So things are coming to light. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So you spoke a little bit about, you know, playing sports growing up. Like, tell me a bit more about you as a kid. Me as a kid, (laughs) I have always been very ambitious. Mm. I think that I'm the oldest of three. Mm. Um, I'm Nigerian. I'm a woman. I think like all of those things shape your reality and shape my reality for sure. Um, Made me very responsible as a kid. I think my mom, she has a saying, whatever's worth doing is worth doing well. So Mm. I think from young, I've always wanted to do things well. I always wanted to be the best at something. Um, And so I... Was definitely studious, got good grades in school, but I was a chatterbox. Like, mm. definitely got the note home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Note sent home that she, she's mm-hmm. a great student, but she tra- she talks too much. Yeah, parent-teacher conference. Yes. Duché is great, but that mouth. Yeah, mouth. Like, definitely. Yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, um, yeah, I was, like, very <laughs> rambunctious. I was very, like, loud. There's pictures on my Instagram of me. I was always striking a pose. And I never have wanted to be a model, but mm-hmm. I was the goofiest kid that you probably, and I'm still goofy. I think people see me as this CEO and mm-hmm. trying to do a better job of like definitely showing my personality. But I have been told mm-hmm. that I am funny. <laughs> and I've been told I'm funny by men. Which, okay, that's you know, hard. Men, that's hard. That's men a hard bar. Haters, so they yeah, like, yeah. Act, even if you are funny, they act like you're not. But mm-hmm. I've been told by multiple men that okay. I'm funny. So. Because I think when we, we give each other blies when it comes to funny, yeah. right? So if a guy tells you you're funny, I feel like that's a really good thing. Because yeah. men are, they can be haters when it yeah, comes they can to be the funny haters. thing. <laughs> I agree with you. So definitely like was just that silly mm-hmm. kid, would dress up in outfits. Like mm-hmm. I was very okay with being different. Yeah. Um. But I think I also still struggled with being different because mm. I think it didn't make sense to me why maybe people didn't like me or things didn't really go the way I wanted them mm-hmm. to because I thought about the world differently. But yeah, I was com- I ran competitively in middle school, high school, and then got a full scholarship to UCLA. Wow. Um, I ran the 400 and it was tough. Mm. Like I love sports and I love what it's done for me because I definitely think I have a lot of resilience and I'm disciplined mm-hmm. um, and I have like, teamwork skills um but it also was just really really hard now that I think back Mm -hmm. and I think that's even why some parts of my life now are still very hard yeah I think I've become numb to things being hard though Mm -hmm. and that served me well we were talking a little bit earlier and I was like when people read my bio I'm like who is this girl and how does she do all those things (laughs) and like that girl is me yeah but I think the reason why it's so hard is that I (laughs) I say that I have stress-induced memory loss Mm -hmm. which is like I've just like compartmentalized so much mm. for better or for worse. And I, I spent the last year really focusing on like getting out of that compartmentalization, yeah. compartmentalization. But um, yeah, sports, sports made me definitely who I am today. And like, just, there's so many things that have come out of sports going to UCLA. You know, mm-hmm. I talk about meeting um, Rochelle, who was my business partner at the previous company mm-hmm. um, we started, which was called Shea Girl. Mm-hmm in partnership with Shea Moisture, mm-hmm. I would never have met her if I didn't play sports because yeah. we roomed together because she was also an athlete. She was a gymnast. Oh. And so it's just crazy how sports has n- made me who I am, but also it's like open doors for me mm-hmm. that aren't even specific to sports. Yeah, that's really good. And so when you went to UCLA, you were playing, you know, you were running track, sorry. So what was your major? Ooh, girl, that's another thing. I'm just, I am a polymath, mm-hmm. like to the T. So I'll tell you my majors, mm-hmm. okay. where we actually ended up. <laughs> okay, walk me through it. I went into uni as a neuroscience major. Okay. I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Mm. Again, something about things being really hard just attracts me to it. And yeah, I yeah. want to give that up. <laughs> I want to give, I want to be a soft like, girlie. I'm passing it I on to pass somebody on. else. Yeah. Um, so I was neuroscience at first, mm-hmm. went in, really enjoyed it because I loved psychology and the brain, mm-hmm. but realized that it was like something that I wasn't sure I wanted to do. So I switched over to um, cognitive science, which is a little mm-hmm. more mathematic, a little bit more modeling of um just like data. Yeah. So it basically takes the data that you would get in like a psychology study and it turns that into like analysis. Hmm. Realize that I do not like, like (laughs) any of that. Um, what is it? Just like data entry and just analysis, R studio, all those Mm -mm. different softwares you got to use to get all, I don't know. Then I switched to psychobiology because I was like, 
psychobiology was this idea of the connection between, and this was in how how long of a time this frame? Is, this is a year and a half. <laughs> okay, this is freshman to half of sophomore. Okay, year. okay, okay. Psychobiology. Yeah. Um, and I was doing psychobiology, and it's the connection between mind and body, mm-hmm. and I thought it was so fascinating, and I thought that's where I was going to actually stay, mm-hmm. and then. <laughs> People don't realize, but when you're an athlete, your coaches pretty much pick your schedule. Really? Like, you have times blocked out where you cannot take classes, and mm. all of the science classes were in the middle of practice. Mm. So basically, that meant I could no not science. take those classes. Yeah. So I ended up, even though I really liked that major, I ended up having to get out of it. And UCLA is a special school where it's really good in the sciences, but there isn't a business major there. The only, mm. the closest thing to business is business econ, which is economics, mm-hmm. right? I wasn't going to study economics. Not I don't care about all. the trends or none of that stuff. So that. I wanted to learn about like business if I was going to be in it. So the other major that UCLA is really popular for, and people call it party sci because <laughs> it's the major people do when they want to party, mm. but it was poli sci, political poli science. Sci. But as I got deeper and deeper into political science, mm-hmm. um, I really started to like it because the – I had this this theory that if I if you could get someone to vote for you for president, mm-hmm. you could get someone to do anything. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, while political science isn't the exact root of what I want to do, I don't necessarily want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be in government. I was like, what can I learn from poli sci? Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad I did it because my concentration was in race, ethnicity, and politics. Mm-hmm. And what was so fascinating is that I really learned about the history of how racism, classism, colorism has impacted the way people's ex- socioeconomic mm-hmm like living. Yep. And so it was just so fascinating to understand how media actually has been used so much in political science to change the way people think. Mm-hmm. I think the most um the most memorable thing that we learned about was about f- like the food stamps and how although food stamps are actually primarily used by white Americans, mm-hmm. it had been branded as yep. this black woman thing. Mm-hmm. Um, single mom single mom black single woman like black single mom thing and it was just fascinating to me because I think another thing that I was understanding about politics and media was this idea that you could change the narrative of something and completely change the way people viewed something yeah and it sounds like I knew all of this at the time and that it like laddered up to what I'm doing now but it really was just the way the wind blew me and so I ended up graduating UCLA with um, a BA in political science Mm -hmm. with a concentration in race ethnicity and politics I had spent the first two years of my time at UCLA doing science classes, so I had my pre-med recs. Oh, my gosh. And then I added an entrepreneurship minor because mm-hmm. it got introduced to UCLA, like, my the last year I was there. So I, like, packed all the um, minor courses mm-hmm. I had to into, like, one year. But I was able to finish with an entre- entrepreneurship minor from the business school at UCLA. That's good. Really so good. So it was a very well-rounded ra- mm-hmm. academic experience. Yeah. My friends, though, thought I was insane. People yeah. were like, New major, huh? <laughs> another but one. Another one. <laughs> like um, DJ Khaled over there. Like Literally, yeah, every another time. one. Yeah. But I'm smiling so hard because I did poli sci in uni. Ooh. So did Maxi. And so did my uncle, literally. So Interesting. I wanted to be a lawyer. My uncle ended up being one. Maxi was, mm, she wanted to be a lawyer, kind of, but didn't end up going that route either. But yeah, so when you're talking about that, I never looked at it through that lens, though. But it's very interesting because everything you're saying is what you get taught in a yeah. poli sci major at all times. Yeah. Let's think about it. To be like the mayor of a town or mm-hmm. the president of a country, you have to get people to like you. Yes. And we learned so much about median theorem voter, mm-hmm. uh, median voter theorem, which is like this idea that like at the end of the day, every, everyone becomes a centrist yeah. because you don't want to pander too much to one side or the other because you'll mm-hmm. never get yeah the majority of people. You won't win. Yeah. So it was just, again, so many things that are fascinating about politics and like politics sometimes aren't even about the policies and laws that go out. It really is about who's interest and mm-hmm. who has the most money. Yeah. Like lobbying was another thing I learned a Huge. lot about. Mm-hmm. Um, whoever has the most money and can literally spend hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks in Capitol Hill, mm-hmm. basically getting people Politicking. to do what they want to do. Politicking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is how you like get things done. And yeah. so it was just really interesting to start to take that lens and apply it to other business industries. Mm-hmm. And so simultaneously, simultaneously as I was doing that, um, all of that at school. <laughs> yeah. I was also starting a brand. I, I talked about this a little yeah, bit earlier sure. in partnership with my friend mm-hmm. and her dad's company, which is Shea Moisture. Mm-hmm. We started a, a brand called Shea Girl. And it was really, it was her I- whole idea. I mm-hmm. was actually, I had never even thought about who made soap. I didn't think about the fact that you could sell it in a store. Yeah. Like I was definitely into dermatology because I loved science. And mm-hmm. after I switched out of neuroscience, when I was doing psychobiology, I realized like, okay, like I'd love to do something um, skin oriented because mm. I feel like your skin 
like your mental health affects your skin. Yeah. So I had definitely gotten into wanting to do something dermatology, but then when I kind of gave up the hopes of being a doctor, I was like, eh, whatever. But when she brought this idea to me, she was like, I know that you like dermatology. My dad has his company. I've watched him do this for years. Mm. Do you want to do it with me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's when this light bulb for me around business and skincare and beauty really became a thing. Mm. The Shea Moisture had done an amazing job at bringing inclusivity to the hair care industry. Absolutely. And then 2017, which is the year before I graduated college, Fenty Beauty had launched and yep. we'd seen the Rihanna proliferation of shades. The yeah. And then I thought to myself, Shea Moisture did it in hair. Fenty did it in makeup. Mm -hmm. Who's doing it in skin? Mm. And although I loved skin, that's really actually how I arrived at like skincare as Got the it. category mm -hmm. that we wanted to, to address. And came to the idea around even dark marks, mm -hmm. right? Dark, dark spots. Yeah. Because that was something I knew was really, really affecting myself, other black women. Absolutely. And it was one of the areas in skincare that I felt people aren't looking at black women. Yeah. Yeah. And like really trying to solve their issues. Mm -hmm. Someone came and sat next to me yesterday at the conference and she mm -hmm. was saying, I've used vitamin C serums, like everything and nothing worked. And then I used faded and it started to go down. Mm -hmm. And she was like, why is that? And I was just telling her, like, we actually do testing mm. and, like, we put things together with black women in mind. Mm. And I always tell people when you make a product that works really well for people on the fringes, you actually make a better product for everybody. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's really important because we were speaking about it yesterday as well about the products and how long it takes for a product to kind of come about. So you graduate from university, right? And then you have this other the other brand, so Shea Girl. So Shea Girl was sold. Yes. Um, as and part of the Shea Moisture acquisition. Right, acquisition. So that was sold. And what year was that? That was 2017. Okay. So that 20 was the end of my fresh, my, sorry, the end of my last semester mm -hmm. of college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so then Topicals then starts to form then, or what happened between then and the, the launch? So um, brands like Glossier were launching, and mm -hmm. I was fascinated with Glossier because mm -hmm. I thought it was the first real example of a modern-day brand that felt lifestyle, mm. that felt like it wasn't just about the products and yeah. the efficacy. It was about packaging, storytelling, yeah. community. Um, I've also been a huge lover of streetwear mm. um, since I was young. I have so many Jordans, so many sneakers. I was definitely like the sneakerhead girl. And I wish I always try to get into it, but I like. Can't. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I lo even now, like I'm a big. I don't even know sneaker. where to start. Yeah, <sighs> there, there's some classics. We'll talk about. Yeah, that. we'll talk about <laughs> the classics. But yeah, I'm such a sneaker girl. But I really was obsessed with like Supreme and mm. Stussy mm -hmm. and these brands that again. They were selling a T-shirt with a box logo, mm -hmm. but people were lining up down the block to buy them and to yeah. buy into this lifestyle. And so a lot of these things were happening, and I was just super fascinated after having that experience at Shea Moisture. I was like, one, I knew I wanted to do skincare, but two, I was like, what would it look like if we could create a modern-day skincare brand that was specifically inclusive to people with skin of color, mm -hmm. inclusive to people with really chronic skin conditions, mm -hmm. and then we made it feel like it was like, culturally cool yeah. like a streetwear brand yeah what would that look like so many people laughed me out the room they were like girl that doesn't even make sense how are you gonna make a streetwear brand like a beauty brand you're gonna make it inclusive and you're gonna show skin conditions and it's gonna be colorful like people were just like mm -mm. it's never been done before it doesn't make any sense mm. three years later and the fastest growing skincare brand at sephora it's sephora it clearly makes it sense. It clearly makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> and as a consumer of the product, one, it works. And two, I use it for, I have psoriasis, right? And to your point, it really hit home a little while ago when you said your mental health affects your skin. When I'm stressed out, I have a psoriasis outbreak. Same. Every time, like like clockwork. I'm going to say like crack. I don't know why, <laughs> but like clockwork. And so literally on my back. And so I use a few of your products um, on that. And it was one of the fastest things outside of like what was prescribed to me that helps clear it up. And yeah. it's the craziest thing. And um, Maxan helped me use my producer of the show but she's also my sister cousin and she was who put me on from the ingrown hair serum first favorite. um Absolute yeah favorite. Favorite. so that that works like a charm so between the sugaring shout out to sugar bush yep and that um literally amazing product yeah, so like you. when we found out anyway i'm i'm jumping around but we're gonna get back to that <laughs> but yeah definitely as a consumer it definitely works so oh it's so crazy to me how people can tell someone something's not gonna work and then a few months or years down the line, the product is selling and doing well. Like, do you ever see those people that tell you it's not going to work? You know what? It's so funny. The success is so much right now that mm. I can't even stop to say. I love that. But it's so funny because they'll come to me and they'll mm. be like, 
we can't believe we saw this before everyone else and we passed on it or mm. we didn't want to invest or because I, I pitched to like 100 investors before people were like, wow, yes. 100, 100, 100. Yeah. People were just like, no, beauty saturated. Like also, I think like people won't say it out loud, but like I was 21. I was mm. a young black girl, but never like, yeah, it's worked at Shea Moisture and done that. But people were just like, Mm-mm. what do you know? What do you know? Like, why wouldn't have the bigger incumbents already have done this if it mm. was such a great idea? And it wasn't until I met Caitlin, who um, is at Lara Hippo, who invested. They wrote a, a check, and she actually ended up getting other people to invest as well. And that's how we raised the first $2 million. And this was, it was so wild because I met her on Zoom mm-hmm. in, during the pandemic. It's crazy. Met her on a call, and, like, the next call, she fast-tracked me to, the to like, the head of the firm. Mm-hmm. And probably two weeks after meeting her, they said yes, that they were going to invest. That's and amazing. she just, she's like, I just knew that it was you. I knew that you were going to get it right and that mm-hmm. it was going to be successful. Mm-hmm. And we talk about this now and I always tell her, thank you for believing in me with when no one else really would. Yeah. And it's so crazy because I'm thinking now knowing your background and the poli sci major, like you got someone to love you, yes, right? Definitely. You got her to love you and to believe in the product. So it's a two, it's a two prong thing at all times. And that's a lot of times why some people talk about other brands and like, why can when so certain people launch certain things, it, it doesn't stick because it's the you part of yes. it that it isn't working and you nailed that before anyone knew who you were yes and yeah. I would say that is what investors if you don't have a track record of selling a business before mm-hmm. or being extremely successful or you don't actually know these investors personally mm. the way you can build trust is by establishing authority and credibility within yourself yeah so I was really adamant to them about the fact that I had worked at Shea Moisture look at all these gaps I had mm-hmm. understood from working there look at how fast Shea Moisture grew look at the mm-hmm. exit price of their acquisition yeah. look at the fact that they took a uh, hair care which was saturated but because they brought in a new market that no one was serving look at how quickly that mm-hmm. grew and look at how the community actually helped them yeah. grow the business versus them having to spend every dollar on marketing mm-hmm. and so I also talked about the fact I went to UCLA mm-hmm. I was pre-med Mm-hmm. I um I had done a business school program at Harvard. Like, mm-hmm. I really wanted to create this narrative that, like, I was the best person to create this. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what investors, if they don't know who you are, mm-hmm. that's the story you need to get them to understand yeah. is, like, if anyone else does this, they're not going to do it right. Mm. And I think that's what I sold to the investors. It yeah. was, like, I'm the only one that understands streetwear, mm-hmm. skin of color. Yeah. The, cu- the current cultural zeitgeist around brands like Glossier, Harry's, mm-hmm. And product development. Like yeah. I'm quite literally the embodiment of what mm-hmm. this brand should be. And yeah, it's what, and it, yeah. and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> yeah. Literally. But it was very a holistic approach to how you went out to people. And the thing, it also going back to the point about being 21 at the time when that happened is also crazy. <laughs> and, but thinking about it, because I can think of a few instances when we look at like people who frown upon age, right? When you're younger, you're just not seen as knowing anything or what do you bring to the table? Cause you haven't been around the sun, you know, all those types of things that we like to tell people. And in certain cases, it actually isn't relevant. I was just going to say that if you think about tech CEOs and tech guys who raise like a ton of money, they actually love the wonder mm-hmm. kid story. Yeah. They love when you're young and fresh and whatever. But I always say when you're young, black and woman, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden Ooh. it's, oh no, like we, that's mm-hmm. a little too foreign of a mm-hmm. concept for us. But when you're, you know, a Mark Zuckerberg, mm-hmm. like we should have the same, and I'm, I'm not shading Mark Zuckerberg. No, no, I, think I get it. Young people should be able to yeah. start businesses because we really do see the future. Mm-hmm. But why would you give Mark Zuckerberg hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, if mm-hmm. not? And then when I come and ask, now it feels as if there's more of a risk mm-hmm. profile. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot of investors that have to actually check their bias because I don't think they mean to do it, mm-hmm. but they their brains work so quickly and they yep. pattern match. And if you don't fit the pattern, it's like they can't calculate they can't it. Calculate it. it. Mm-hmm. They cannot come And the numbers it. are not making the sense. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. So topicals now is launched. It's 2020, right? And so you've launched middle of the pandemic. Yes. Um, how did that go? It was so stressful. Like it was so stressful because our launch actually got pushed back mm-hmm. from March mm-hmm. of 2020 to um, August because of the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I say that, like, I'm so glad we launched during that time, but also I literally lost my mind during that time oh because God. everything that could be delayed was delayed, whether it was packaging, the formulation, um, even the funding did not mm-hmm. come until a month before we launched. Oh my so we were literally scrapping the smaller checks that we had gotten yeah. up till that point. I remember running out of money in November of 2019, and I was so fortunate because – Three days before Christmas, mm-hmm. a an investor, um, his name is Glenn. Mm-hmm. He is his 
he's so such an interesting guy because he worked at Google in the machine learning and AI department before it was really a big thing and yeah. really made his success off of that. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, he literally has the Midas touch when it comes to inclusive beauty brands. Wow. He's invested in this hair care brand for women with super curly hair, us. Like, he just really understands it. Mm. And he's a white man from, like, Northern California. But, like, when I tell you that he's so committed to understanding. I love that. And he just, he gave us a $300,000 check. And, like, for an individual, not a fund, to yeah. give you that money is, like, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. And he it's always tells me, he's, like, you're, like, one of, you're, like, he's like, you can't have favorites. But he's, mm-hmm. like, you're one of the people in my portfolio that you just amaze me every time mm-hmm. that the check I gave you, look what you've, like, done with it. Mm-hmm. But we literally ran out of money in November. That check came three days before Christmas. And like I remember Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. And then I remember <laughs> the next thing was just March 2020. Mm. It was almost like every single time I felt like I was going uphill, mm-hmm. something would happen. Crazy. So what I really loved about that period, though, is that because we couldn't physically get the product, mm-hmm. we tried to figure out ways to create community mm. before then. So we launched this game. It was like a quiz, a horoscope quiz mm-hmm. called Skin, Sun, and Stars. And it was basically, um, again, a horoscope quiz. So mm-hmm. you would give us your time of birth, your date of birth, and then you would fill in your skin conditions. Mm-hmm. And we'd print out like a natal chart for you based mm-hmm. on that. So if your rising was, let's say, Virgo, mm-hmm. we'd specific, we'd talk about a specific ingredient that was really great for your skin mm-hmm. that was very Virgo-oriented. Mm-hmm. And that game went viral on the internet, on Twitter. Wow. We had 10,000 people play the game before we launched. And that's mm-hmm. how we were able to even show investors that summer that like, hey, look, we're struggling to get the product out because of supply yep. chain, because of X, Y, and Z. But you should believe in us and in this brand and write us a check mm-hmm. because look at what we've been able to do with like no, no money. product, <laughs> no product, and no, no money as no well. No product. Yeah. And so I always give people the advice that like in those hard seasons when you're trying to get that money, you're trying to get people to buy in, think like a marketer. Mm. If you have no physical product, and I think a lot of people think that that when you get the physical product, that's when the money's going to come. All mm. of a sudden, you're just going to put it on your website, and people are going to be like, "Oh my gosh, I found this brand. I love it." No. Learn how to be a good marketer before you get a product. So by the time you get a product, you can just start selling on day one. Love that. And so you start selling on day one and you sell out. Crazy. Yeah. Like, how did that feel? You know, this whole experience has been, again, I am a spiritual person. So I always Mm -hmm. say, like, God really, Mm -hmm. God wrote the script. I'm just acting it out Mm -hmm. is what I really believe Mm -hmm. because you would think that even my background of poli sci, pre med, all that, meeting my friend whose dad owned Jay Moisture, like you would think that I mm-hmm. put myself in those positions mm-hmm. and I didn't. And I think similarly with this, even the Skin, Sun, and Stars game, like while yes, we, we've always been really smart and kitschy about how we like put things together, I didn't know that game was going to get 10,000 people exactly. to play. It. Yeah. I didn't think when we launched, people were going to be so excited that they were going to sell us out in 48 hours. Like it's crazy. I didn't know any of those things would happen. And it's mm-hmm. so funny. I look back at what our forecasts were for that first month mm-hmm. and we 10 X that in that first month. Wow. And I just could not believe that it happened. But I also, again, while I do think faith and luck and mm-hmm. all of those things in pl- favor play into it, I also do like to tell people again, be really strategic about mm-hmm. how you're putting your energy into something mm-hmm. because if you do something for long enough and you have consistency, it will it will yeah, be successful. Absolutely. So then, okay, so we said at the beginning, right, around it, your topicals being the fastest growing skincare brand this year in, and I'm going to say 2023 because obviously this will live online forever, <laughs> um, in 2023, right? So how do you get from selling out into 48 hours into Sephora? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we sold out in 48 hours, we were actually in Nordstrom okay. through like a pop-up. So we weren't officially in Nordstrom. It was just like a holiday, mm-hmm. summer pop-up that okay. they did. So we were only in there for, I think, um, it was only three months that our, our mm-hmm. agreement was. And so when we sold out in 48 hours, um, a Sephora buyer actually reached out to me because they had seen that. Mm. And I think that's also why I always say be a good marketer even before your product comes out because trying to get a, a Sephora buyer to get like to get their attention mm-hmm. is really, really difficult because they get sent a lot of pitches. Got it. So you also don't want to be that brand that's sending a pitch. Mm-hmm. You want to be the brand that they find out on the internet and they're yeah. like, Ooh, we have to get yeah. that. And so shout out to Shelly who mm-hmm. works at um, Sephora, but she saw us online do this 48 hour sellout thing and was mm-hmm. like, Ooh. sent it over to mm-hmm. her team and was like, this brand is really great. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we ended up uh, having a conversation with them we ended up getting into the Sephora Accelerate program, which is like an accelerator for beauty brands at Sephora. And that program was really phenomenal because it teaches you everything about the business of Sephora, the business of beauty, mm-hmm. how to market, how to finance your company, how to run a PL. I how love to do that, manufacturing. that they do that. Mm. Yeah, it's an amazing program. And now it's very, sp- it's specific to underserved 
um, cr- um, founders. Okay. So it used to just be in general for beauty, mm-hmm. but now they've specifically made it for underserved founders, which mm-hmm. is really great because yeah. they do need to increase the number of brands they have in their stores mm-hmm. that are started by black and brown founders. Yeah. But yeah, that's really how we got into Sephora. So I also tell people these opportunities to get into these programs, mm-hmm. make sure you're taking them up on them, mm-hmm. apply to them, talk to people who've been in them before to get a good idea of how to build a really good application. But yeah. Make noise on your own so that someone sees you. And then when these opportunities mm-hmm. come for these programs, apply. Yeah. And then the cool part about the Sephora thing that I like, and I said this to you yesterday, but I'm going to say it again, is I remember being in Sephora for a few months ago, and it was like two shelves, right, of your products. And we were in there in New York last month, and it was like this entire section now. And it's got the big Topicals brand at the top. And as soon as you walked in, we were like, okay, cool, there are Topicals. We go over there, we get our products. And so that the evolution of the product in Sephora as well, has also grown incredibly fast like online and it, you know Amazon it's everywhere yeah. right like how I mean that's got to be an amazing feeling but how how does that really feel for you <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I sound so morbid but I, I do like to be really realistic with mm-hmm. people because I think that it's been so hard like getting mm. from the outside and even sometimes I pinch myself right because in three years for all of this to have happened mm-hmm. does feel like I've had an easy ride mm. But if I could even if if the walls of my apartment could talk, <laughs> if my brain, if I could really say what I wanted yeah, to say about yeah, all the yeah. different things that have happened to me, um, it's been hard. Yeah. And I think what's amazing about that Sephora expansion is that we actually started Sephora.com. We were not in Sephora stores when we launched in March of 2021, wow. like when we launched with them. Mm-hmm. And we sold out in 48 hours there, too. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the 48 hours. I don't know what God yeah. does, but in two days. <laughs> It'd be working it out. Two right? days. That's he a works sermon, it out. girl. We can sort that out. <laughs> in two days. There's something about that 48-hour yeah, mark yeah. for us. Um, but we sold on those 48 hours at that 2021, um, Sephora March launch. And again, Sephora usually just tests brands online. Mm -hmm. They don't automatically move you into stores. I'm sure you've shopped some brands Mm -hmm. where you can only get it online at Sephora and not in stores, but we did so well that they were immediately like, let's go into all stores. We went Mm -hmm. into 500 doors in under six months. That, that sounds like work. Not normal. And it is quite literally almost impossible. And there's just so many things that happened during that time. We had a flood that impacted our warehouse that Mm. flooded out some of our ingredients. We had, we just had so many things happen. And, and so it's been hard, like just Mm -hmm. pulling the brand from the next phase to the next Mm -hmm. phase. But I think again, externally, it looks like it's flawless Mm -hmm. and seamless. It does, but this is what you want. Right. right. (laughs) But, um, It's definitely been difficult, but I think it's so exciting because, um, so we rolled out into all 500 stores by the end of the summer in 2021. And then, um, in 2022, we got a second placement in the store, which is in the beauty on the fly, which Mm -hmm. is basically the, by the counter. Mm -hmm. So we have faded mini fadeds Mm -hmm. in in there. Mm -hmm. And then this year, earlier this year, that's why you're saying that what you're Mm -hmm. seeing is that we now have end caps in over 250 doors in the U S that's crazy. Um, and more coming. (laughs) Um, and so it's just really amazing because we're quite literally selling through our inventory so fast. They actually have to have us on the wall Mm -hmm. in that little shelf. They have to have us with our own end cap and on the beauty on the fly, because Mm -hmm. if not, we run out of product too fast. So it's been just so cool that like we're getting all this expansion and Mm -hmm. more footprint in the store Mm -hmm. because our community is really going out and selling us out yeah. day after day. Absolutely. I was telling you yesterday, like, you know, cause obviously you don't, we're not here, you're not here in Bermuda. So when you go away, you go and you stock up before the next time that you're going away. So you have people buying in bulk. And I remember walking around the last time, cause I knew we were doing this. And the last time I was there, well, at the time I was hoping we were going to do this. And I remember walking around Sephora and almost every person that we were looking in had something topicals in their bag. Like oh, I remember God. that. Remember it specifically. And I remember cause I was looking because you know, for this and I was like, this is actually really cool because it's not just, just us coming in here to just get topicals you know what I mean it's other people buying into it too which was really cool I'm so gassed when people say that and so funny because I I feel like I get really shy it's just like I've never had an office I've worked at my apartment for the last five years on this brand and um again our team is fully remote we've done this over zoom we do meet in person Mm -hmm. I do fly into town to see to people see people but it's just wild what can happen mm. when you again consistency and resilience and excellence yeah and that's another thing people don't take into account is like people want to just put something out yeah, to yeah. Make quick cash mm-hmm. like i'm so meticulous our team is so meticulous like shout out to julia our creative creative director mm-hmm. she's extremely meticulous about how things look yeah how we put things out and so i think it's yeah that makes me so happy to hear that people are buying topicals mm-hmm. something that just like started in my brain is now a physical product that yeah. people 
Girl, in my shelf their, in the bathroom. Yeah, right? spend their hard-earned <laughs> money on. Yeah, I love that. And so yesterday when we were talking as well, like Maxie brought up like how involved are you in like the day-to-day running of the company? Because we know we have some CEOs who are like, oh, I created it. I'm just kind of like the face of it now. So how involved are you? <laughs> Maybe more involved than I need to be, mm-hmm. to be quite honest. <laughs> and I think that like I'm more involved than I need to be, but also I've really loved this last year. I've mm-hmm. also been able to step out of a lot of things. Like mm-hmm. we do definitely have expertise in a lot of different areas, sales and marketing, strategy, um, finance, product development. Like we have people now mm-hmm. to where I don't actually have to day in, day out. But I will tell you, every the inception of every product comes from my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and if not from me, it's like me in partnership with our product development lead. Got you. Every campaign that Topicals comes out with, except for a couple of them that the creative director really leads, if it's like e-com or mm-hmm. comes from my mind. Mm-hmm. And I think what I'm super excited to is like to kind of let that go. Mm. I think the team is super brilliant. And it's been fun, though, because I just really actually love branding and marketing to be a part of it. But yeah. I think I'm really excited to also let people on the team let their like like the ideas that they have come mm-hmm. to life as well. Yeah. But still got to be up hard to now, though. Yeah. yeah, it is hard. Yeah. Every, but I would say like the team is actually super, super strong. And I think what's really great is a lot of the people that are on the topical team where we share the same mind. Mm. So even if I don't come up with the idea, it's an idea I feel like I would have come up with mm. or an idea that I, ext- I like a lot because they get me. So got Julia you. gets me. She knows how to translate. Mm-hmm. What I, Again, I was not a, a, a creative when I started this brand. I was mm. definitely more of like a science business girl. Got you. And she's really helped me learn how to translate my ideas yeah. into the world. Got you. And that was, again, I struggled so much with that the first like two years of the brand. Um, but yeah, I, the products, I would say mm-hmm. pretty much everything that you see Mm. has come from I, I like plant the seed because mm-hmm. I don't want to take credit for the full thing because again Julia like Stella our, our creative team is excellent yeah but I'll plant the seed of something and then they'll go out and like mm-hmm. reference it and see what it looks like see the colors and then they're the ones that truly bring it to life got it I love that so I mean we've talked about all this stuff and how crazy the past five years of your life have been in terms of like business and growth and taking all of this on like when do you find time for family and friends and a personal life and dating all of that like when do you find time to do any of that type of stuff yeah um so I think that there's so much I've learned about myself in the last like two years really and one is that I'm quite a selfish person Mm. and that's okay Mm. I used to beat myself up so bad because I knew I was selfish and not necessarily selfish in that I wanted the glory but just Mm. that like I was so committed to this dream becoming a reality. Like I was so protective and selfish of it that I definitely think that there's relationships that, you know, I didn't foster well. There was, you know, family that I haven't, didn't see for a while. But I also think that I am allowed to do that. And I um, was talking to my parents over Thanksgiving that you come into this world alone and you die alone. Mm. And while I think community is really important and family is really important, I never want to stand before God and for Mm. God to tell me, did you do what you were sent to earth Mm. to do? And for me to start saying like, oh, but God, I really had to like hang out with my family. Mm. I really had to have a man. I really had to mm. I, like all those things to me are secondary to the gift that God has given me. And so, again, I have spent a lot of time beating myself up for being selfish about really, really wanting this dream to exist. And what I have realized is that while, yes, it was selfish because I wanted it to come to fruition, look at how this brand has touched so many more people than I thought I could ever touch. Absolutely. And so I think sometimes you do have to be really set boundaries. um, And I think your twenties is the perfect time to do that. Yeah. And so unfortunately that means that not everyone is going to understand you. Not everyone can come with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been the hardest part of this journey. um, But also the most just like eye opening and rewarding. Cause it's also really great when you do meet people who do want to Mm. continue on and people who do want to, adapt in the same way you're adapting um but I will say like I don't think I'm the best at staying in contact with friends or with a man or Mm -hmm. you know all of these different things even with my family but I've this last year has allowed me to breathe a lot more yeah I talked a little bit earlier about compartmentalization and like I started to realize through therapy that like I was compartmentalizing not just work I was Mm -hmm. compartmentalizing life everything everything that was happening to me because it's really hard to switch it off yeah yeah for sure and so I committed myself committed to myself this year that I was going to feel all my emotions Mm. the good ones and the bad ones I was going to feel all my wins Mm. and my losses and um that I really was going to unpack my life like I wasn't going to go through life successful on the outside but like not 
internalizing what was going on. Mm. Um, and I think because of that, I have also, again, let go of a lot of things at topicals. Like there are things at topicals where I'm like, I wish I could do that like myself. Yeah. I could do it a specific way, mm-hmm. but I can't, like, I just can't, if we want this to scale, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. What I can do is lay a foundation and a groundwork and communicate with that person and coach them up so that it gets to where we need to go. Yeah. But it's not going to be perfect on day one and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But what that's allowed me to do is it's, I can date now. Mm-hmm. I can go on vacation. I can, you know, I'm living in London now. I am was living in LA for the last 10 years, living in London. Now I've been able to live in London and not skip a beat because yeah. people can be yeah. in person in different places. I don't have to be at anymore. Mm-hmm. So I'm definitely getting better, but I would agree with anyone in my past who might say that I was not exactly um, the most, um, I was definitely like a, more of an absent partner. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm really glad that I can say that mm-hmm. because I think, yeah, the self-awareness is there. Just about to say, because I mean, you said something earlier about being selfish and then I was like, in my mind, I'm like, I don't know if that's selfish or setting the boundary because you're so focused on your vision. But then you said boundary and I was like, perfection. Because selfish also has like this negative connotation right. towards it, which sometimes I think it's okay to be, especially when you're in growth mode. Like a lot of people don't understand growth mode when you're running a company, right? Or in your career or anything like that. People just kind of let life happen to them. Yeah. But when you're in growth mode and you have a vision that you're trying to go on, sometimes other things fall to the wayside of, you know, every, everything else yeah. while that's happening. But how would you say your parents feel about you and what you've created? Um, they're definitely happy. So I think my mom was, when I first told her I wasn't going to med school, she was so upset because she was mm-hmm. like, you'd gone to UCLA, you got there on a full ride. Like mm-hmm. you can go to school for free. Like, yeah. Go do the hardest thing that you can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad is an entrepreneur, and he was like, "You'll figure it out." Yeah, like he literally was like, Love that. "He's an entrepreneur," mm-hmm. so he was like, "He gets it. You'll get it. Mm-hmm. You'll figure it out." Um, and so I think now they're extremely proud of me. Mm-hmm. I think they, because they're first, I'm first gen, and they mm-hmm. came from Nigeria and like created a new life. They wanted me to be what they couldn't be, mm-hmm. but what they thought they could be was very limited. Yeah. Oh. So me being you know, beyond their wildest dreams. Now for them, I think they, it's opened their eyes to see that like even my dad, he's had tons of companies. My dad is raising capital right now for his business. Mm. And like, he only started raising capital for businesses instead of funding them himself or getting bank loans when he saw that I did it. Yeah. And so again, it's this idea that like even their, their view of of themselves has been expanded by what I've done. And I think that that's so amazing. Mm. Does my mom still nag me about getting a man? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Of course she does. She does. 100%. Does she nag me about spending more family time? She does. 100%. We adore her for it, though, because yep. I think that's I've what also... Moms are supposed to do that, right? right? I feel like they're supposed to do that, right. so that's okay. And I think, again, in this year, I've very much evolved. I said, growing up, I was never the girl who thought about a fairy tale wedding. Mm-hmm. Like, I always thought about beating the boys <laughs> in sports. I thought yeah. about school. Um, but now, like, I would love a fairy tale wedding. Mm. I would love, like, you know, to um, be in a relationship with someone and be just you know locked in with that person and yeah like I I have a heart like yeah. I think that's that's what I could <laughs> you think that was me? I you think, think that people was, don't didn't think that people before? don't think I have I would I would say like a lot of people might think that I don't mm-hmm. and not that I'm like rude or mean but just like yeah yeah that I'm so focused focused yeah just that people are just like oh like you don't have time for anything else but I definitely like I want to have kids like yeah. these, these are all these things that again like if you asked me two years ago I didn't want to have kids I didn't like I just didn't know about a lot of things because I just hadn't even given myself time to think about that. Yeah. And it just felt like so many things were like being thrown at me in life. And I just was like felt like I was being backed into a mm-hmm. corner. And um, I think now I because I've been given the, the space to be able to think about my life and care for myself. Mm-hmm. I definitely am like, I want to be a mom. Yeah. I want to be a wife. Yeah. Like I want to be more of a sister, more of a daughter to people around me. Mm. I still want to make money though. Yeah. <laughs> that's on the top. That's I on still the list. Make money, that's though. on the list. That's and you know, I think when you create something, right, and it's yours and you're like that's just a it's a baby too, you know, of what right. you've kind of seen come to fruition. You want to make sure that that continues to do well and regardless of what that looks like right. after that. So I guess quick pivot though on so last year around this time, you came to Bermuda. Yeah. Yes. So tell me about how you ended up here. Yes. So in, I think it was May, Mm -hmm. I went to a business conference in Nashville Mm -hmm. and I met a woman and I need to um, reconnect with her actually, but I met a woman and we were sitting on like the bus as we were traveling out to this estate that we were going to for Mm -hmm. the business conference. And um, she was telling me about Bermuda. She Mm -hmm. was like, her cousin lives in Bermuda and she went and visited him and she was like, yeah, you know, it's only 90 minutes off the coast of New York. And I was like, 
like mm. minutes off the coast of New York. Like, how come I've never really heard of Bermuda? Yeah. And no one's ever talked about it as like a vacation destination. Uh-huh. Um, and so she was like, um, yeah, like I really love it. And um, it's a small island, but like it feels like home. It feels yeah. like community. And I don't know why that stuck so much with me, but in October, my birthday's October 27th, mm-hmm. which I think you said your yes, dad. my dad and my And his birthday. twin brother. Crazy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, We're all just like cray cray small, but I mean, you connect with people, but yeah, right. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was my birthday. And I, at the time I was just really going through a lot of like soul searching and um, like w- that year had just been so hard, like mm-hmm. extremely hard in so many different areas. And so I was like, okay, I want to do a trip for my birthday. Usually I like stay home. But I was like, no, let me just go somewhere, just have a good like four days. And I ended up going to Bermuda because I was in New York. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, let's, I took yeah. my friends and I was like, let's go to Bermuda. I took three of my friends. Mm-hmm. And I, ha- I stayed at St. George's at the mm-hmm. St. Regis mm-hmm. and I loved it. Like I was just like, this place is beautiful. And at the time too, I was getting connected with the BTA, mm-hmm. the Board of Tourism. And they invited me to come to the PGA tour after I just yeah. kind of told them a bit about myself and some of the people I was bringing. Cause yeah. all my friends are also like influencers. Got it. So I was like, yeah, we'd love to like attend. And, and Kaiwan was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so we went to the PGA tour. I got really close with the, P- the BTA mm-hmm. office. And then I just started thinking to myself, like I actually have to come back to Bermuda mm-hmm. and I have to bring people with me. Mm-hmm. And so fast forward the next year, a couple months back in yeah. August for our third birthday, we brought 18 influencers out mm-hmm. to Bermuda um, from the UK and the US, um, a mix of, again, content creators, some of our um, philanthropy partners, mm-hmm. um, experts that work with us, so estheticians. Yeah. And we celebrated our third birthday. That's so and cool. And I think it was the first time for me, too, that I actually like stopped and paused and mm-hmm. was like, wow, this is three years old and we have the enough money we have enough resources mm. to bring folks on an all expenses paid mm-hmm. trip to an island like Bermuda mm-hmm. and they got to experience the culture the food and I just felt so proud because we are the first I would say black owned brand yeah. to do a brand trip of that size absolutely here and mm-hmm. I just again I hate that we're the first because mm-hmm. I wish that more black owned brands had the opportunity to do those kinds of things yeah again funding is lacking for founders mm-hmm. of color but because we have the funding. I always tell my team, we have to be good stewards of the funding we've been given, the opportunity we've been given. And I was just so glad that we brought brown and black influencers, Love some of the people first time out of the country mm. to a place like Bermuda. Yeah. And then, so you were here, you fell in love with Bermuda and like, I feel like you've kind of, you know, in, bought into Bermuda. You know what I mean? Like you've, you were so like cool. We saw you obviously yesterday at the BTA summit. So the Bermuda tourism authority summit, And, you know, some of the things that you were saying about, you know, the culture and exposing people to the culture while they were here is something that doesn't really happen when you think of brand trips. Like, why did you want to authentically kind of show Bermuda to the people that you bought? I think it's because I am someone who's not from like the U.S., right? Mm. I'm not from European culture. I'm from African culture. Mm. I'm Nigerian. Yeah. And so when someone comes to Nigeria, it's not just about staying at the like super expensive high end places and only eating at high end restaurants. Yeah really immersing yourself in a culture. That's how you're really going to get a great experience. Mm -hmm. And so when we came here, I think just because of my own background, I was like, I want to live like a Bermudian while we're Mm -hmm. here. And so I think that's really what it was. And I think, again, because the audience that came was also black and brown content creators, they could see themselves reflected in the people who were on the island. And so I think they really enjoyed that and were really just like happy to come and experience. And there's definitely people who have been like, Next Bermuda brand trip, make sure you call me. Make sure you call me. Make sure you call me. I know it's so crazy because, you know, we are off the coast of New York, right? It's 90 minutes away. You know, we joke around. I joke around telling my colleagues in the U.S. I can get to the city faster than you can from Connecticut. Like, you know what I mean? Truthfully. From Bermuda. And, like, it's so – I love that you came here because so many people still don't know how close we are to Bermuda, right? And I feel like that trip put Bermuda on the map from the influencer perspective and obviously for topicals 100%, but also from a Bermuda perspective, like everything online was Bermuda yeah, that week. That like week. it was topicals, Bermuda. Everyone was like, oh my God, I had friends reaching out to me from uni that were like, yo, topicals is in Bermuda. Like, you know what I mean? I got to come, all those types of things. Yeah. So that reach expanded like so far. Like how was the, how were the numbers for you from a marketing perspective? Yeah. 9 million impressions, crazy. which is wild. Like wild. 9 million impressions. Like there's not any other campaign that we've ever done that has mm-hmm. had that kind of reach. Wow. Ever. And so I think 
for us, we um, were excited. One, mm. because people had a great time here. Yeah. But then also as a business, like we got a lot out of the trip. And so I think that it, again, left brain creative, mm-hmm. right? This idea of like, how do we marry creative ideas, yeah. like a brand trip with business fundamentals, mm. reach, impressions, conversion? Mm-hmm. How do we marry those two? And we're going to continue to to try and drive those things home together. Mm-hmm. But it's just a great example of being a left brain creative and thinking about what are the new ways? Yeah. And I won't say that brand trips are new, but I think the way that we executed that brand I trip. I totally agree with you, new. 100%. And like, I don't think I've ever seen a brand trip that anyone's gone on where all of the creatives were black and brown yeah. people, right? I don't think I've ever seen that. So I feel like that was intentional, right? And then the other thing about it as well was also coming here. Like, we have other brands that come here, but not all, as often do you see people kind of the way that they tourist in Bermuda is, you know, ingrained into our culture. And I think that was also the really cool part. Like, I think you guys went to Stars, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> we went to the local clubs. Yeah, exactly, like, we were right? in it with Had everybody. Had a good time, right? And then, but you also stayed at Hamilton Princess and all those types of things, too. So I think that was really cool. And, like, you know, as a Bermudian, one, you're proud, right? Because it's like, finally, someone gets it, yeah. you know? Like, they're showcasing us authentically. And then, two, it's just like, this was really cool. Like, you know what I mean? And, like, you want more it to happen more often. So, will you guys come back? Oh. So, announcement mm-hmm. that we made yesterday, mm-hmm. and I will make it here as well, is that we have committed to Bermuda being our annual birthday mm. brand trip. So, you will continue to see us in Bermuda mm. every Love year. That. So, again, I know my phone is going to ring when this goes live because people are going to say, okay, we know you're coming to Bermuda. We know you're coming. You can't even lie to say you're not (laughs) coming to Bermuda. So, call me. Yes, exactly. Um, And we'll definitely want to bring back some of the core group. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll try. I think brand trips are hard because you want to bring new people, but we definitely want to continue to celebrate with some of the core people from that group. And so, we'll probably like, we want, we actually, we loved everybody. So, we'll Mm -hmm. try to, you know, mix and match the different trips. But it was amazing. And it was was your first brand trip. First ever. Yeah. We were nervous. Yeah. Nervous. Because, you know, we had seen other brands do brand trips and, like, things go wrong and influencers Mm -hmm. not be happy. And so I think we also did a really great selection of the people on the trip. Shout out to Alyssa on the social team, Tony and Imani on the influencer team at Topicals. They really decided, like, okay, this is who we're going to bring. And it was absolutely the best group of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something to also keep in mind as an influencer is, like, these brands, it costs a lot of money to do this. So, like, mm. if you come on these trips, like, yes, obviously you should have a level of expectation of these brands, but you also have to give them grace because there's so many things that you don't think will go wrong that may go wrong on these trips. And the, yeah. the brand is new to this island as well, or they're new mm-hmm. to the location, or they don't know everybody. And they, they've tried their best to, you know, get mm-hmm. acclimated and prepared. But I think that's what's been amazing, though, is a lot of the influencers we bring on the trips have never really been invited on trips. Mm-hmm. So they were also grateful. They were grateful and yeah. so happy. And I, I love I got those that too. Of people. I yeah. got that as well. When I was following, I follow a few of them on TikTok, and I felt that too. They were like super excited yeah. to be here, which is what you want, right? Right. You also want people to be respectful too right you don't want anyone who's coming representing your brand and then tearing up the hotel exactly you know what exactly. i mean like people, people were so polite yeah um so yeah that's like kind of even our criteria yeah. for influencers it's, it's not even just about reach because we didn't have not every influencer on the trip had even north of a hundred thousand followers we mm-hmm. had some people who had less than a hundred thousand followers mm-hmm. who came on the trip but they meant something they represented something in the culture in their community and they were also extremely polite mm-hmm. And I think, like, this is an exchange, right? Like, yeah. brands bring you on this trip, you create content. And, again, the stories that people told, I was so glad because it wasn't even just about our product. Mm. Like, these trips aren't just, okay, sell Topicals products. Yeah. Like, I love Destiny, who um, goes by Owawa. She's mm-hmm. a travel influencer yeah. on Instagram and TikTok. She literally made a video on TikTok talking about how it was the best brand trip she's ever been on because she actually felt included. Mm, I love and that. And I, I think that that, to me, weighs more than her talking about, oh, like, I love the faded eye mask. You should buy them. Mm-hmm. You know, like she took the time to hopefully show people the heart behind Mm -hmm. topicals, the Mm -hmm. spirit behind topicals and not just like the money side. And I think it can be very difficult in a capitalist world Mm -hmm. where, yeah, we have to make money. Like that's Mm -hmm. the only way we get to keep these salaries, keep the lights on, you know, pay people, do the trips. (laughs) But it's it's just this way of, again, left brain creative. How do we create new business models? How do we create new ways of doing business so that it feels closer to community? Keep talking about this idea of community centric business. Mm. How do we do that? How do, how, do, how, does, how do people win as a community and not just us as a brand? Mm. And that's why even with the things with Bermuda, we're coming back. We're going to be doing uh, master classes for the founders on the island, young okay. founders on the island. We are going to be um, donating to charities. Mm-hmm. We already donated to the Women's Resource Center yeah. while we were here in mm-hmm. August. And so we have to leave something. Yeah. We have to give back to people when we're 
coming to these islands and, Mm -hmm. you know, partnering with influencers because if we give to them, yeah, they'll give back to us. Absolutely. Like, we're the fastest growing skincare brand because somebody's buying the product. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not the one exactly. Sephora buying the product. There you go. So, so. And it makes sense. And But it also goes back to your point that you made earlier about creating community, right? Before you even had product, you know, you did the quiz that you had online and you created that community. And I think you're doing that with the brand trips that you're, well, the trip with two Bermuda that yeah. you had here. You created a community. Like the one thing that Dion said, um, the content, uh, the photographer that you guys had, um, he was talking about how how he just felt it felt like a family like yeah. everyone that was there and how he still keeps in contact with no, everyone that's there. is in with all the influencers <laughs> that i see who our shared followers are and yeah, it's like yeah. so many people like the filmmakers on the mm-hmm. team were like yeah next time i come to the island like can we shoot a film together can nice. we you know and it's i love, like, that. I, I love that too because mm-hmm. it's this idea of even without topicals now mm-hmm. people still get to come back and give yeah. something to the island and mm-hmm. they get to get something out of the island i love that Okay, girl, we are running out of time. Yeah, so we have a lot to talk, talk about. about. You know, I can I talk. We could do a part two next time you're in Bermuda. Next we'll time I'm here. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just being conscious of time, like all of my guests, right, before they leave the couch, the one thing I want to know is when, you know, knock on wood, it's a very long time from now, when you're no longer here on this planet and Topicals is doing amazing, whatever it's doing at that time, what do you want people to say about Alama Day when they mention you? I want to be known mm-hmm. and I want to feel like an empty vessel Mm. I want to make sure there was nothing left in the tank there was nothing that I should have could have would have done that is in my personal life that is in my professional life particularly my professional life Mm -hmm. like I think topicals is just the beginning for me Mm. like it's so much fun but it's just one of the multiple things that I will do and if you know me you know I'm busy (laughs) um with things already but like I I really want to have explored all parts Mm -hmm. of myself and I really want to challenge myself to be the best version of myself, mm-hmm. the most creative, the most business oriented, um, the most just community oriented. And again, there are moments where I'm going to choose to be selfish and I'm going to set those boundaries. And I think people will not like me for those moments. And I think that's okay. But I also don't want to lose myself while trying to gain all of these things. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I really want to be known for. Like mm-hmm. I want to be known for... <laughs> I'm saying this. So that I just said something really deep, but I'm about to say something that is so goofy. <laughs> but I want to be known as the baddie who funds baddies. There like, you go. I want to, I really love fashion. I love, like, y'all know the ginger hair is my yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, I have a specific look. I like mm-hmm. nice things. There's nothing wrong with liking nice things. Not at all. But I think, how do I acquire these nice things? And then my situation help to fund someone else to acquire nice things mm-hmm. is kind of the way I think about it. Mm-hmm. Again, y'all, I'm really, I'm really a scripture girl, but... The scripture says we're blessed to be a blessing. Mm. I feel like I've received so many blessings because God knows I'm a good steward and he knows I'm going to give it right back Love that. or I'm going to disperse it and share it. So that's what I want. I want to be known as the baddie who funds baddies and there's no gender around baddie. So exactly. There you go. It goes up there. Coined here. You heard it on Hustle Heart podcast. Yeah. (laughs) And I'll say one more thing about why I call out the fellas is that I do think that men don't always respect me as a business person. Mm. And I think it was the same thing in sports, right? Where like, oh, you're a girl. Like physically you can't run faster, even though I could mm-hmm. beat most of the boys mm-hmm. in my grade, right? Mm-hmm. But I think in business has been super interesting as well. I don't think a lot of men would take business advice from me, even wow. though my company probably makes more money than the mm-hmm. things that they've done, right? And again, money isn't the only um, metric, to, metric of success. But, but it's a big one. And I just think that men, I, that's what I would challenge a lot of like the men in the world to do because there's so much you can learn from women because we've had to figure it out with so much less Mm -hmm. that like if you took your power and the privilege you have as a man and you listened to a woman and you actually gave it to her to guard it and steward it Mm. you would be out of here out of here that's kind of biblical too child you know a proverbs Proverbs 31 wife yep she multiplies mm-hmm. her man's stuff. Like exactly. a prob- I think a lot of people think a Proverbs 31 wife is submissive, submissive yep. mm-hmm. and weak and, all- mm-hmm. no. and allows the, the man to do whatever and she has no say. And that's not what a Proverbs 31 woman is. The scripture says she surveys the land, which there. basically means you tell her, mm-hmm. I want to buy this land. And she goes and looks at the land to see if it's good land. Mm-hmm. And then you make the decision based off mm-hmm. what she said. Yep. And again, not to say that there's like a power imbalance yeah, there, but yeah. it's this idea that like a Proverbs it's a 31. Yeah, yeah. A Proverbs 31 woman is, she's smart. Yeah. Like she's the type of person you want in your corner because mm-hmm. if you were building a team, she's, she's the, the shack to your Kobe. There you go. She's the, who, who are the other duos that, um, when was it LeBron and, and 
and Dwayne, and Dwayne Wade, Wade, yeah, and at the Heat, like yes, when they were at the that Heat, that is the that's that what you're trying to go for. for. And so that's I do good mesh, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I do challenge men to like look at women business owners. Don't think of beauty or think of these different categories as like mm-hmm. just these fluffy categories. Mm. The women are printing cash. Yeah, there you go. I don't know if y'all heard. Skims this year is on track to do seven hundred fifty million dollars in sales, up from five hundred million dollars last year. That's crazy. Which one of y'all's the men's businesses do are we doing see? That. And even celebrities, we don't mm-hmm. see you printing cash the way Kim Kardashian knows how to print cash. So we need to respect women in mm-hmm. business, and we need to stop seeing again certain categories and certain businesses that women do as like less than or yep. fluffy because that's not the case. And also, women are massive consumers. Okay, they control eighty percent of the household spending. There you go. It's just crazy to so think about. If you are, this is Hustle Her, but if you are a him, a him <laughs> you need to be listening to, to the women. I'm and glad you said good. that too, because I have so many men that say to me all the time, stop me in the street. When are you going to have some men on there telling people what to do? And it's not that I'm a gangst man in oh, any way, shape, or form. Have that. But we thank <laughs> you. We have it, right? And I love me some black men, right? Yo, love, respect, love, respect, respect, respect them. and love us. You know, black we love men. this. We, it has nothing to do with any of that. But sometimes, you know, it's also okay for us to have a bit of shine and showcase the amazingness that women are. Yeah. And I think that that's fine. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Anyway, thank you, Alama Day. I'm so excited we got to do this. I really appreciate you. No, thank you. Yeah. You've asked me so many questions, and we've explored so many topics that I don't typically talk about oh, in episodes good. and podcasts. So okay. thank you so much for some of the insightful questions as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, guys. So I know I always say I'm super excited, and that was, like, such a great episode, but I genuinely mean it again this time. And I'm so grateful for Alama Day spending some time with us today. She is the founder and CEO of Topicals, the fast fastest growing skincare brand at Sephora this year in 2023. So make sure you guys head over to Sephora. You could have her to the website. You can buy all of your own products there and you can support. If you're in Bermuda, let me tell you, I get mine sent to mailboxes and then I go pick them up at mailboxes and I use it every single month on that Amazon repurchase every month. All right. So make sure you guys go out and you support topicals and all the different brands that all the different, sorry, products that they have there. Make sure you head over to the website. Um, the, uh, we'll have the show notes up there there on the website for you guys to check out also you can sign up to be a vip member on the podcast for the podcast and you can get some more interesting things that we have coming up have some giveaways with some of our sponsors um, that we have coming and then also you can see the blog from some of the behind the scenes that we did here today as well as some some of my additional thoughts about the episode maybe you can give me some feedback of some of the questions you wished i would have asked her while she was here and then hopefully the next time she's in bermuda she'll come back and grace the couch and we can sit down and chat about them as always Big shout out to 59 Front and Brown and Company for sponsoring this season. And thank you again for spending some time with me and Alameda today on Hustle Heart Podcast.